I'm going to kind of play bits of songs, I think, yeah. especially songs that we know well, you know, because we don't need to... Uh... Now, Nicky last time round kind of played only a very small snatch of songs, so I might give him a bit more than that. Yeah. Actually, you know what I think I'll do? I think I'll skip to... Um... Uh, I was listening to some stuff this morning on my way into work. Oh yeah, I have Midnight Well album here. Hi, how are you doing? Know? And uh, I think it's this one. Very welcome. Oh, that's actually a cover, isn't it? I don't know who the original. Yeah. Anyway. Who? Mercy Beats. Mercy Beats, is it? All right. Thanks, Mike. All right. So. Okay. Okay, well this morning, right, I mean this obviously has been on my mind all week, what am I going to play, what am I not going to play? And uh, I was listening to some of the stuff this morning on my way in, and this song came on. And it's not necessarily regarded as a classic, it's two and a bit minutes long, and I just thought, it's almost like perfect pop music, or perfect rock pop. And I'm just going to give it a spin, and again you'll probably, yeah, you will know it. Let me see if I can... I'm gonna, pitch, I'm gonna play the whole song because it's only two and a bit minutes and it's like so concise, perfect guitar rhythm, great vocal from Philip. John, you're welcome. Good to see I might actually play that one out now. Um, as I got a bit older, um, like when I was like... Ah, Nicky, great to see you, how are you doing? Um, some albums started coming into the house, you know, uh, Harvest and Tea for the Tiller Man, and uh, Machine Head by Deep Purple, I mean, Smoke on the Water was a seminal riff as well. And one of the albums that came in was a bit more slick, I suppose, in a way, than a lot of that stuff. And I just fell in love with it, and I still love it, and I still listen to this a lot, you know. Given that you kind of have access to everything now, it's very special if you go back to it regularly, you know. And uh, it's not everybody's taste. It's a bit smooth, maybe, for people, for some people. It's a band called Kato Bell. A lot of people here know Kato Bell. Nicky played a little snatch of Kato Bell at the last one of these sessions. I saw them in the pavilion when I was about 14, my sister Imelda and uh, John Dunton actually, who's been at a lot of these sessions, he's not here today, uh, they brought me along to it and uh, they're Scottish. Maggie Riley, beautiful singer, she later sang on some of Mike Oldfield's first songs that he had vocals on and she was the singer. Very, um, Maggie Riley, she's Scottish. This song is about, I think, the death of Jimi Hendrix. Sometimes 
just lovely, you know. And these guys came and went and nobody heard about them, or very few people heard about them. It's so hard, isn't it, you know, in music. They were a mid to late 70s band. Like, you know. What's that, John? They supported Heart in London at the Old Vic in October 70s. Right, yeah. And Keith Olsen, just the other. Yeah, they did get a bit known in Limerick. I did play in Limerick a few times, and if you ask people of the right age, a lot of them will know this band. Anyway, let's get a bell. Do you have any of them in the library? No. <laughs> but is it available online? Uh, yeah, friend of mine. I posted something like this presentation on, on uh, Facebook, and a friend of mine who remembered Kelly Bell got the album off iTunes or whatever. So let's get a bell anyway. I'm going to just leave that aside. Uh, oh, yeah. Experiences as you grow up. This yeah. last was major experience. Yeah. Again, my sister Imelda was responsible. She brought me, and uh, Audrey McMahon at the time was with us as well. And uh, this just was amazing. And uh, well, I was I was a fan of Dylan by the time I saw this uh, film, and it confirmed for me there was something otherworldly about Dylan. You know, like seeing him in the flesh, and even yeah. uh, even in a film was like, wow, he actually exists in this yeah. pl on this planet, like you know. Yeah. And uh, Joni Mitchell's uh, Coyote, and I think might give a blast of the Hegira version of Coyote in a while. Yeah. How you doing? Oh, good to see you. I didn't think you were going to be here today. Yeah. You're, you're yeah just fun, postponed your trip. Uh, yeah. That's great. Even watching yeah. the film now, if you skip past the, the uh, commentary, yeah. it's, it's still great to watch the best worlds. E just e even Neil Diamond's not too bad. Yeah. Yeah, Neil. Yeah, yeah. Everybody yeah. says that. I, I, I even Neil isn't too bad. I became a fan of Neil Diamond. Did I drop to me and he said, you don't bring me flowers? But uh, listen, guys, I think um, undoubtedly, uh, to me anyway, and it's, well, I'd say a lot of people would agree, the highlight of that show is, is Van Morrison's Caravan. Yeah. And the band loved it. You could see mm -hmm. Robbie Robertson was so enjoying it. But I'm going to play something else uh, because I'm being perverse. And uh, it's the second. <laughs> no, the second highlight of that show for me, of the film, after watching and hearing it hundreds of times, mm -hmm. is uh, the band themselves yeah. doing the Night to Draw Dixie Down and Leaving Helms. An amazing rock vocal, one of the best vocals ever, I think. Now, I should be playing the whole track, but I probably won't play the whole track because there's a point in this song, actually, towards the end, where the band just lift into some, the, it, and the audience lift with them. You can hear the audience going with them. It's just amazing. It's, like, I don't expect it to uh, hit you on this listen, but you should listen to it sometime. You can feel the band and the audience lifting just in a moment, like, you know, into that other mystical kind of elevated thing, you know, that music does for you sometimes. And Van Morrison has done that loads of times. Uh, this is a bit slow getting going. Come on, guys. Okay, I'm just going to try to relax for a couple of minutes and let that play. I'll see what I'm going to do next. I mean, I hate it on the radio when DJs fade out songs and stuff. But this is the moment. I'm 
Yeah, I think. Um, that uh, concert, 1979, March 12th, in the Savoy. Unbelievable that uh, the rock guitar god Eric Clapton was playing in town, wasn't it? You know, I'm sure many of you, or some of you at least in the room, were at that. And uh, I was at that. It was probably the third or fourth gig I was ever at in my life. And Freddie White Band supported, and that was a whole other discovery then. <coughs> Freddie White, Scully and Paul Brady, Planksty. That gig, you, you know, it's amazing how moments can... Like, a friend of mine called up, over to my house when I was 12 years of age, and he had a cassette with Hurricane on it. Lifelong Dylan fan, as a result of that moment. What if you called over to my house and he had, are you experienced? You know, and my, maybe the first Dylan song I heard then might have been... Um, you know, rainy day women, and I might have thought, Jesus, what the hell is that? I never listened to Dylan again, like, you know, it's weird, just these moments happen in your life. And uh, the Clapton concert was just a great night, and I mean, I kind of remember Freddie White better than Eric in a way, and I remember Albert Lee playing guitar, it's just like, he was kind of cleaner sound. But this concert, the Just One Night uh, show is from that tour, it was recorded in the Budokan in Japan, same band as played in the Savoy. And um, I haven't really stayed a fan of Clapton, but I just love this, and I'm going to give this a run. This is his version of, his live version of J.J. Kale's After Midnight, and uh, it's his best solo, I think. You know, in terms of the dynamics, it mightn't be technically, but... necessarily listen to somebody doing a solo for 10 minutes but uh, uh, I just love that do you get do you get what I'm saying about the dynamics of it I don't know Mike is a guitarist I mean technically that's probably not amazing is it oh no no but the dynamics are great yeah isn't it just, uh, and the second solo in the song is probably even tears, more tears from heaven uh, huh you compare that to tears from heaven yeah yeah. Just don't know. yeah yeah well no I mentioned Freddie White there because um, that set me into another thing I remember a few months after this gig I'm 15 now, and probably in second year in school, and uh, there was a folk club in the Glenford Hotel, down in the basement, if That's anybody right. remembers that, small, long, narrow room, yeah. and uh, I heard Freddie White was playing. Two of my schoolmates came along with me, Judah Mahoney and Pat O'Donnell, and we arrived, and Freddie White wasn't playing. It was this band called Scullion. Oh, I, I, I was reading Hot Press at the time, so I had heard of them, and I knew that Sonny Condell was in it, and I loved Tiernan Og from, uh, again, my sister's records. 
but I knew there was an Illin Piper in it as well, and I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't up for trad, you know. So I said, Sonny Condell, Illin Piper, I will go, and the lads came along. And Scullion were just amazing, and it, uh, people who were around at the time just loved Scullion. And uh, now, uh, oh, yeah, what did I think? I was going to play the catch you went to hunting, but then I thought, oh, let's just play some. Yeah, no, I think I'll put on the catch you went to hunting. So this is like the first time being exposed to Irish music for me, apart from, I suppose, uh, and apart from the you know, whiskey in the jar. Yeah. Very crackly, and there'll probably be a skip or two in this now. You know, and it's just gorgeous. So. Cat, she went to hunting and found the barn a blazing. And back she's come a calling, a calling, a calling. Wake up, farm boys, the barn is burning down. Now the rats came up in the hundreds, and the cat she caught a plenty. I remember now, I wanted to play a bit of the fruit smelling shop. This is supposed to be based, derived from um, an extract from Ulysses, but I don't know if anybody's tracked down the actual section of Ulysses that this is supposed it to be. It is actually. They have? It's by them, it's tough. It is there, is it? Yeah, okay. This is just lovely. Uh, Rita Connolly does some of the work, uh, backing vocal on this. Just to show the different stuff that they did, you know. track on this. Uh, Sinead O'Connor re, uh, kind of uh, popularized I Am Stretched on Your Grave. Yeah. She took her arrangement from Scullion and actually, you know, you know, everybody has their own opinion about music. I think that Sinead kind of really overdoes the emotion in it yeah. and kind of, uh, kind of loses it by being too yeah. kind of intense. Now I'm, again I'm only going to play a little bit of this track and I'm going to drop the needle in the middle of it. Oh no, that's, uh, that's John the Baptist. That's the last track on that too. Love priest and love prime yours. Love prompts me in dread. Oh yeah. Because And I mean, I, I was, I was as mad about Scullion as, as I was about anybody else, Dylan or Van Morrison or whoever. I just loved them and their concerts. I mean, they had two acoustic guitars, two singers. That was it. There were three guys on the stage, and uh, people who saw the, the dynamic, the energy of their shows was amazing. Now, meanwhile, I'm listening to Dylan and Morrison and John Armitrading and Johnny Mitchell, 
And all my 15 and 16 year old buddies have discovered that there's this thing called punk music. And I, I, when I, I, okay, I'd like to be cool and say, oh yeah, I was into Sex Pistols in 1976. I didn't like them at all, actually. I didn't like the aggression. It scared me a bit. And um, I didn't get it, okay? I confess, all right, I wasn't into punk in 1976 or 1977. But then it kind of morphed a bit, right? And then you're getting Elvis Costello, Blondie, um, Squeeze, I'm definitely going to play a Squeeze track. Um, Graham Parker, who's kind of new wave, kind of singer, songwriter, rocker. Uh, hmm? The Clash. The Clash, as they became less, <clears throat> you know, but nobody could deny London Calling. And then we just, what? Strangers. Strangers, of course, No More Heroes. Uh, I think the first two songs that I really got was Public Image by Public Image Limited and No More Heroes. Oh yeah, also a Clash song, but not one of their best known songs. I can't remember, off the second album. Anyway. Then we discovered, oh jeepers, there's Irish bands doing this. And look, let's, I don't care what anybody thinks about U2. When U2 came out, came along in 1978, and Fanning was playing Out of Control and uh, Boy Girl and Stories for Boy. It was serious. It was really exciting. You listen back to the stuff and you think, it's not really great, is it? Well, anybody that was around kind of felt something. This band, is a, like, it only happens once a generation, probably. You got your, the Beatles. I know the Beatles were magnificent and all that, but there's something extra. The X Factor, whatever that is. And you two had it. And we all went to see them in the present in... Uh, 1970, uh, 1980, February 1980. I never became a big U2 fan, but there was something, you know? band in the world. I don't know. No. It's weird, isn't it? The blades were ahead of the festival. The blades, I don't know if the blades were quite there at mm. that stage. Uh, uh, they're not on this. No, this is just for kicks. This is a compilation of Dublin bands in oh, 1979. Yeah. Yeah. The blades would have been on it if they were around. Unless they were couldn't for copyright or licensing reasons be on it. I but I think they'd be more 8081 than... Yeah, they, they started recording in 1980. Yeah. Did it? Okay. I'm going to just throw on a couple of seconds of, I'm pr it's pretty John Dundon isn't here actually, John um, has been at the last few, he's away I think, and he uh, ran a gig uh, venue called The Gaff, and uh, he brought a lot of uh, punk bands and new wave bands, again I wasn't a huge fan of, uh, of that stuff, but there was a couple of the bands, Big Self was one, and then this crowd, uh, Johnny Finger's sister is one of the people in this band, the new versions. I'm just gotta play a couple of, uh, just a minute. It's called Tango of Nerves. They, like uh, you mentioned the Stranglers and I was saying the song, the, the uh, Public Image, which I think is a great song, and this one.
yeah, I wasn't really get, I didn't really get punk for a while, and uh, even when the undertones came along, again another confession, I didn't really like the undertones. I didn't hear uh, Teenage Kicks. First song I heard about them was Jimmy Jimmy on yeah. Top of the Pops. And I thought, geez, this guy is like an altar boy, and uh, the the song is very basic and Jimmy Jimmy oh Jimmy Jimmy oh. I thought stupid. Then they came to Limerick, and uh, I wasn't going to go, but one of the guys in my class got one tickets uh, in a radio thing, right? And he actually, he realized that it was a two-part ticket, but they were only selling one part. So he was supposed to have two tickets, but he actually had four. <laughs> I don't know if you get what I mean. Yeah, yeah. The, anyway, Kevin, I bought a ticket off him. I said, I'll go, the lads are all going. And uh, talk about Road to Damascus, you know, the, the gig. Anybody here at that gig in Savoy, February 1980? Of course, Nicky was there. Uh, so, now obviously Teenage Kicks is the obvious song, so I, uh, I won't play that. I'm trying to find track six on this. One, two, three, four, five. I think this is it. Yeah. Just, oh, that's the end of it. <laughs> There's a lot of tracks in it. Again, it was about energy, wasn't it? You know, I didn't get it when I saw it on top of the pop school. I the Savoy. Oh man, it was incredible, you know. And um, there was a huge amount of trouble at that gig, but it all happened over at one side. We had a great time, we didn't know any of that was going on. The, the film Good Vibrations, if you haven't seen it, you, it's fantastic. Have you, have you, and again, I don't know if that's one that we have here. I don't think it is, actually. Good Vibrations is about that record label, uh, Terry Hooley, set up in uh, Belfast to record these guys. Uh, well, actually, I think it was Rudy was the band. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. But then the Undertones signed up with him as well. And uh, it's a great film. He was a completely maverick character, I really. And uh, yeah, I definitely should see that. Oh yeah, and there's a whole moment in it where they release, um, the Undertones release Teenage Kicks and they're not getting anywhere with it, and John Peel picks it up, and he plays it, and then he plays it again, and it's like, oh, he said, that's so good, I'm going to listen to that again, and he played it twice in a row on the radio, and like, you know, it was just amazing. Now, so I was getting to like, I, was, I liked uh, that some of these songs, Public Image, <laughs> the, I, the Undertones and so forth, but I still thought, the real stuff is Bob Dylan and Van Morrison and those guys. And this is grand for a bit of, you know, it's fun, you know. And I didn't see that it had substance, really, you know. And I think the band that made me see that there was substance to what was generically called New Wave was Talking Heads. Now I'm going to try this one on. Uh, Daniel tells me that this record isn't in great shape. But I'm going to try this last track on <coughs> side one. It's called Memories Can't Wait. And um, there are other more obvious songs on the album than that one. But Right, it's not a good Okay, we'll skip that one, sorry about that. But uh, Talking Heads and Elvis Costello were the two kind of so-called new wave artists that made me realise, okay, this is serious stuff. It's not just guys trashing around in a, in a garage. And uh, like initially it was Oliver's Army and... Um, that great cover he did, what's the, the Sam and Dave song? Um, no, Can't Stand Up For Falling Down. Who said that? Man John. Yeah, that was actually Sam and Dave B-side. But anyway, later on then, um, Imperial Bedroom, yeah, 1982. And uh, for me, for a long time, I had no hesitation. If anybody asked me what was the best record ever made, 
I'd say um, maybe Astro Weeks, but Imperial Bedroom would be right up there. It's hard to know what track. And it's an album, really, you know. I mean, um, there's good songs on there, but you'd kind of be a bit reluctant just to pick out uh, a single track. Um, but there's one, maybe. Uh, where is it gone? If I could remember. Yeah, yeah. Man Out of Time. Number five. I'll see if I can drop the needle successfully on this one. Yeah, uh, yeah it's just this is an amazing album with great arrangements. Two, three, four. I should have a, I should have hired a DJ John to to take care of this part of it. <laughs> on the electronic format but I just wanted to play as many records as I could today you know but you know uh, like this made me realize there's a whole other world of music that I should be taking seriously and not just be stuck in one little corner you know um, what was it gonna do I was uh, yeah meanwhile so I was like I was really into this whole new stuff but I never let go of what I loved either. I never felt I had to drop something just because I picked something else up. And um, I just want to throw this on because uh, um, this is uh, one of my favorite albums. I know it's Tom Donovan thinks it's probably the best album. It's Joni Mitchell's Hegira. And uh, there's probably, you know, nobody doesn't think it's a great album once heard it. And this is the first track. It's the one she performed at the last waltz. I hope it's okay. I'm just going to play a couple of minutes of it. Beautiful sound, of course. No we just come from such different sets of circles in your life. Early on, you're ready. You'll be brushing on the roof, there's tail. While the sun is ascending, and I'll just be getting home with my real dream. Okay, that's really lovely. And um, like the last waltz was very important because you know, okay, you, uh, for probably for many of us, uh, definitely for me, my first time seeing a proper blues performer. You know, Muddy Waters did a, a song on it, and that opened up the whole world of blues music, and then. One interesting crossover, I suppose, between New Wave and older music was Joe Jackson. I never bought a Joe Jackson record because my brother Joe was into Joe Jackson, so he bought all those records. But uh, the, he, he did these first two really good New Wave, punky kind of albums. And then he took this kind of left turn, or maybe it was his fourth album, into swing jazz. It was bizarre, you know? He did this album called Jump, Jump and Jive. Jive. That's really lovely, isn't it? Yeah. And again, Joe bought, my brother Joe bought that album, so I didn't buy it. Uh, but I did t think, well, I should check out these guys. And um, this is Louis Jordan. Uh, there's about four Louis Jordan songs on um, the Jump and Joy album. And uh, just going to throw on this one. You have to 
take your fingers, surely. Hey, the bar the station with a pack on my back. I'm tired of transportation in the back of a hat. I love to hear the rhythm of the clickety clack. And hear the lonesome whistle, see the smoke from the stack. And pal around with Democratic fellas named Matt. So take me right back to the track. Jack. Choo choo, choo choo, jaboogie. Woo woo, woo woo, jaboogie. Choo choo, choo choo, jaboogie. Take me right back to the track. Jack. Another songs of his were massive, like million sellers in the, the States in the mid 40s. You reach your destination by the last of our life. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. You can, uh, there's some great songs on it. Actually, I realized when I got this um, that there was a song I knew and I loved. Uh, called Is You Is or Is You Ain't My Baby. And the, re the reason I knew that was because it was in a Tom and Jerry cartoon that was on TV a good few times. That was brilliant. <laughs> when I heard it, I couldn't believe it. So, um, yeah, new wave, folk music. Yeah, I mean, I hardly mentioned folk, really, you know, because I, I really loved all that as well. Uh, the festivals, Liz Doon, uh, Ballast of Air was a great festival. Uh, so, yeah, it's all going on, you know. But Van, really, uh, in terms of concerts, the, I was at Van in 1982, in October 1982, in the Olympia. He did a, night, a week of shows, and myself and my sister Aileen and a couple of our friends went to see him on the second night. We had heard that the first night hadn't been great, and it was unbelievable. It was the great experience of live music for me. And it was all down to one of those moments I was talking about in the um, Night to Draw Dixie Down, where the audience and the band just moved into this other zone, you know? And it happened during a song called Summertime in England, which is too long to play. And uh, I actually have pr very close um, to that version. It's on the B-side of a single called Cry for Home. And uh, it's, it's in not in great condition. But uh, anyway, look, he had a great band at the time. I mean, the Caledonia Soul Orchestra of the 1970s is kind of his great band. But the band of 1982, were damn good. Um, P. Wee Ellis on saxophone. And he had two drummers. I thought this was really interesting because he's not like rocking out like, but there was two drummers in his band at this time. And you might be able to hear it on this. This is Dweller on the Threshold. It's not even anywhere near my favourite Bob De uh, Van Morrison song, but I just was listening to stuff and this just caught me and uh, it got the dynamic of that, um, of that band. And I have to, there's a little intro I want to kind of skip. Uh, this is a life in the uh, Grand Opera House Belfast. I'm going to leave this run to the sax solo, because the sax solo is gorgeous.
it's lovely, isn't it? Do you like, like that? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, I still like Van, you know, but I saw him a couple of years ago in the UL. I mean, he's, he's older now, I suppose, as well. But, like, it was grand. It was nice, like. Uh, but there was no sweat spilled on the night, I can tell you. Oh, the grumpiness. The grumpiness is legendary, and it's true. <laughs> uh, so, uh, this is a band I love. Echo and the Bunny Man. Now, I've never really really loved a particular album of theirs but they had some fantastic songs and what one I think I'll throw on Seven Seas they brought out a couple this was kind of late on in their original um, time track four just something lovely about their melodies and uh, McCulloch's voice of course one two three four That's the end of the previous track. Uh, what's this? What's this? here actually um, and it's a beautiful album it didn't get any notice at all really it's, you, you yeah, know it's a new album actually it's supposed what? to be coming out soon I see uh, yeah, well him and the brother I believe oh right okay it's like in kind of the same room as well. yeah Candleland is worth checking out it's really lovely and the title track is one of the nicest songs uh, now uh, Squeeze I think Squeeze were one of the great bands uh, now I mean you wouldn't I don't know you don't get passionate about Squeeze there's just something really lovely about them uh, and great musicians and all that and um, I think Crowded House were kind of trotting after Squeeze You can kind of hear Paul McCartney singing this actually couldn't you, you know, it's kind of And as I say, you might kind of like regard them as the best band ever. But they're definitely very underrated. They're a really strange band because they really they didn't have a sound. Every song sounded completely different. Yeah, they? yeah, that's very true. They did a whole country thing. And of course, they were quite new wavy, kind of punky and early on. Yeah, uh, very varied. Very good no, I remember around 1983 or thereabouts. Yeah. Sorry. That's nice. It's like very good lyrics in their songs. Yeah, very well written. I love listening to the words of the lyrics. Yeah. Um, I remember around the time uh, MTUSA. It was great, like, but really, to me, there was something gone wrong with rock music. I wasn't hearing stuff really, you know. And people, like, even Elvis Costello, brought out a couple of weakish albums. Goodbye, Cruel World. You know, I didn't go for it. Um, 
uh, talking heads even, I didn't, uh, you know, things were gone a bit sour, right? And all that was happening was the Thompson Twins and Michael Jackson, of course, which nobody can deny, Thriller is incredible. But you know, it wasn't rock and roll to me, it wasn't the sweat. And, the, and then, Vinnie Hanley, in the middle of all that stuff, threw on these guys. He played two songs together, uh, one from their first album and one from this album. This is R.E.M. and this song is called South Central Rain. And it's, I think this just kind of totally revived. Oh. Sorry. Classic, classic DJ error. When I saw this on NTUSA, I thought, praise be to God. And I also thought then the same thing, uh, um, perfect skin, light, sco light cold and motions on top of the pops. That was another one that I thought, oh, praise be to God, because all you were seeing was Duran Duran and Spandau Ballet and the, the hair and the suits. And, and then this guy comes on, he's wearing a leather jacket, a pair of jeans, Rick and Becker guitar, you know. Uh, fantastic. So, uh, hope revived, and then the whole thing happens. Lads, I'm going to go on a little bit past two, and nobody should be embarrassed about getting up and walking out. Storm out, if you wish. Because now I'm on a roll. I'm not stopping anytime soon. No, I tell you. But then REM, right? Uh, REM, the Smiths, Prefab Sprout, all these people came along in the mid 80s and saved rock and roll. And then there was a really interesting happen thing happened in. Um, in the States, which was flipping barren for rock music, really, I felt, uh, after New Wave, the Talking Heads and Ramones and stuff. What was happening? There was nothing happening. And then this started happening, rootsy kind of rock and roll stuff. And these were all coming along on, um, behind R.E.M. It was just happening around the same time. 10,000 Maniacs, Guadalcanal Diary, The Beat Farmers. There was no Violent Femmes. I have a great Violent Femmes album there, Hell of Ground. And uh, to me, I'm going to play just a little snatch of this Las Lobos, um, I think. These guys, it turned out, I got the Las Lobos album, and I thought, I had heard one song um, from their full album, How Will the Wolf Survive? And I thought they were, that was them. You know, I thought they were a rock band. Turns out they are a rock band, but they're just the cleanest kind of rich. They're, they're Tex-Mex, of course. But actually, just... I didn't go for it initially, I have to confess, but I realised after a while. <coughs> this is just lovely stuff. It sounds like it's running slow, Is that a 45? It sounds like it's running a bit slow. Oh. So it's very simple, the rock and roll music, but these guys were serious players. Uh, huh? Yeah, uh, yeah. This is actually a Richie Valens song, yeah, right. you know. Yeah, yeah. You know these guys, the long riders. Of course, Nicky and John know them. <laughs> yeah, well, this album is a great album. Uh, the second one, the Lucy Clark one. I can't remember what it's called. It wasn't great. Uh, it's just lovely, clean. I'm not a musician. I, I can play C and G and D if you want me to. But uh, to me, that's just beautiful guitar playing, and it's probably not the most complex. I don't know. That's Lobos. I saw them with Neil Young a couple of years ago, but I was very disappointed because one of their main guys, uh, Cesar Rojas, wasn't there. And they didn't say, they just came out, they played their set. They never said, oh, Caesar is sick, or Caesar is at a wedding, or... I was raging, like, you know? Uh, <laughs> out of it. <laughs> Maybe he was. Uh, I'm going to throw on a little bit of um, Long Riders. They, they call themselves after the uh, Walter Hill movie, The Long Riders, and they threw the Y in then as a nod to the birds, and you'll see why they gave the birds a nod when you hear this. I haven't listened to this in a long time. I don't know whether... Uh, 
whether uh, room test, uh, I don't know whether the um, track four. I don't know what kind of state this record is in now. One, two, three, four. <laughs> songs in that are as good as or better than that one. Um, no, um, I'm going to gigs all the time as well and of course uh, you know you get to see the odd big 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 act in the Savoy or whatever but mostly it's uh, lower level and the Irish scene really uh, boomed in the mid 80s and you know you had you know, I'm going to like uh, the Blades, the Atrix, so those are kind of early 80s. Um, <sighs> help me out, Aslan, Into Anua, Quarter deck from Donegal, loads of bands. That was a bit later in the 80s. And uh, these guys, I, I don't, this could be a 45, is it? It is. Um, you, you'll remember them if you're, uh, if you're off the right vintage. Light a Big Fire, Tom McLaughlin, uh, Huey Gallagher, the drummer, died actually. And um, uh, they played upstairs in the Savoy a good few times. And uh, Tom had a kind of, I, I kind of think of him as a kind of a Randy Newman kind of uh, sarcastic kind of vibe. And we just played a little bit of CIA, which was their best known track. <laughs> I mean, I know there was always local bands, but there was something about that mid-80s to late-80s period where we had um, average contents who became too condensed. We had the groove, uh, the outfit. Uh, the O'Malley's started up around that time, and they were a great band, even though they were a bit of a mess, <laughs> you know. Most of the time. Huh? A bit of a mess most of the time. Most of the time. Some great songs. Um, you know, Ger Costello and Peter wrote some really good songs. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I suppose the ones that nearly made it, like Granny's Intentions before them, nearly made it, were Choose the Blue, of course. And they brought out this amazing single. Best version, actually, I think. It is. This is better. The album was a terrible disappointment to me. I thought the uh, production, I know Dave Richards died, and we should be nice about him, but I thought it was a terrible produced album. Yeah, very, bombastic very sounds, you know? Very music, very mild compared to the... Yeah. Uh, well, this, this is quite bombastic as well, I suppose. But oh, yeah. it's... it's, it's uh, it's leaner.
Yeah, it's really lovely, isn't it? Um, and of course, there's some fantastic guitar soloing in there by Dave Geary at the, towards the end. I heard this being reviewed on a kind of a show, uh, you know, singles review show on RTE. Um, it might have been, I can't remember who the presenter was, but Brush Shields was the guest, and this was on it. I just happened to hear it, and Brush was like, yeah, that's a really good song. But that guitar player, where did they get that guy from? And of course, that's Dave Keery, playing guitar now for the last five or six years, Van Morrison's guitar player. And no wonder. I always, I always hoped that Dave would be, would get somewhere because I mean, seeing him just playing locally. So I, the guy who played here. Uh, Dave, Dave played with Mike. Mike O'Donnell yeah. is behind you there, and Dave oh. played guitar with him. Yeah, were you at that night? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. lovely, wasn't it? He was, he was particularly. Good. Uh, Dave is just so classy, and Dave. I mean, I've often said to Mike, the thing I love about Dave Keery is he can do flipping pretty much anything, as far as I can tell. But he doesn't always, you know. He just got a great feel. And that's something that a lot of brilliant technical guitarists don't have. Dave knows when to play and when not to play. So, um, do you know what, guys? I think I'm only I'm only up as far as 1988 or so, but I think I might leave it at that because uh, it's part two. Huh? It's part two. Part two. Well, um, there, we don't have any um, club next month because you know it's a holiday time. But uh, Alan English is going to do a spot for us on in September. I can't believe you went through your whole music and you left out Dylan. Did I not play Dylan? No. <laughs> okay, anybody who wants to leave, leave now. <laughs> this happened to be <laughs> Uh Yeah, okay. Actually, do you know, I had in mind to finish off, thanks very much for coming, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I had in mind to finish off with like a Rolling Stone just to say like this was, this was the start of rock music. But since I have this one here, uh, this is, uh, if I had to nominate, it's not going to be Rainy Day Women. Huh? It's not going to be Rainy Day Women. It's not going to be Rainy Day Women. But if I had to nominate, you know, if somebody was holding the gun to my head and said, nominate your favourite doing song, I think I'd have to go for this. Tricks when you're trying to be so quiet. Visions of Johanna. We're all doing our best to deny it. And Louise holds her hand full of rain, tempting you to defy it. Blades flicker from the opposite loft. In this room, the heat pipes just cough. The country music station plays soft, but there's no, nothing, really no. nothing to turn off. No, no. Just Louise and her lover, so entwined. And this vision. Actually, you know what, let's, uh, I will just say one more thing, another couple of minutes. Um, I posted a thing on Facebook lately about a gig I was at. I was at this gig in Dolan's, which was like seven or eight, eight local bands a couple of months ago. And I mean, the quality was amazing, you know, and I mean, those of us of my vintage might be inclined to think, ah, oh, you know, the 80s were great, and, you know, in terms of the local scene, Tuesday Blue and The Groove and all that, this stuff is better, Foxjaw are incredible, the wind windings are amazing, and uh, who else did we see, um, that guy, what's that guy's name? Niall St. James. Niall St. James, does anybody know him yet? Because you will, you will know him, I'm convinced of it, like, he's brilliant, um, soul singer, kind of, you know, and a great out there performer as well. So there's great stuff going on. Like, um, and nobody should be sitting around lamenting that the great days are gone because the great days aren't gone at all. Um, it's kind of, I don't know, maybe... It's, it's, <laughs> huh? Isn't this the most beautiful piece of vinyl ever produced? Yeah. I don't know which side, is on, which side it's on, but I'm just trying to... I've never played the vinyl, actually, because I downloaded it as well. Let's see how it goes. Uh, 33, yeah. <coughs> so this is Windings, and um, they've, they're on their fourth or fifth album now. Yeah, this is the first track, if it ever gets started. This is the first time this record has ever been played, it shouldn't be a scratch on it. So, look, 
no, I think that's a good place to leave it. You know, that, uh, you know, to me, I obviously loved the old stuff, and uh, you know, because records, it was mostly the old stuff. But I don't think there's any reason to despair about the current music scene. I mean, you know, it's very different now. They're from Limerick. Yeah, Windings. Yeah, great band. Um, anyway, that's it really. I love music. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye.